Welcome to Grow Virtually, an online horticultural educational program presented by the Master Gardener Volunteers of Cobb County. Under the guidance of the University of Georgia Cooperative Extension Service, we grow gardeners. Welcome and thanks for watching. My name is Joanne Newman. I've been a Master Gardener since 2013 and I'm very excited to talk with you today about a subject that I get very excited about and one that occupies quite a bit of my time, landscaping. Having gardened in several parts of the country, from the fertile plains of central Illinois to the rocky glacial tills of New England and the clays of both Alabama and Georgia, I can assure you that one size does not fit all. But there are some common things to consider no matter where you live and garden. So this presentation takes us back to the basics helps you to take stock of your landscape and gives you some information and tools to help you toward a healthier and happier yard. So this is what we're going to cover today. Be mindful that these are the basics. Any of these topics are subjects unto themselves. First, assess your property. Make a plan. Test your soil. Select the appropriate plants or seeds. Follow a gardening calendar for our region. Use correct planting techniques, water and mulch appropriately, and most important, maintain your garden for success. So before spending your hard earned money or exhausting your energy, you need to assess the conditions on your property in order to be a successful gardener. There's an old adage that holds true right plant, right place. Why is that? Because plants have different needs for climate, water, sun, soil, and slope. Let's examine all of these a little bit. The U.S. Department of Agriculture has classified the country into different climate zones based on temperature data. The most recent update was in 2012. We here in Cobb County are in climate zone 7B, but on the border of Climate Zone 8A. Why is this important? Well, according to the Department of Agriculture, the USDA plant hardiness zone map is the standard by which gardeners and growers can determine which plants are most likely to thrive at a particular location. The map is based on the average annual minimum winter temperature divided into 10 degree Fahrenheit zones. The lower the number, the lower the temperature. Plant labels, catalogs, and books will typically list the zones in which a plant will thrive. If you live in zone five and purchase a plant for zones eight or nine, you will likely need to replace it annually or bring that plant into the house for the winter. Just like temperature, sunlight affects plant health. How do I know how much sun I have? Well, once the trees have leafed out in the spring, create a chart or diagram and make hourly observations to plot the sun exposure in different parts of your landscape. It is a great project for kids or grandkids, especially if you don't have a lot of patience. The amount of sun your plants need or will tolerate is also found on plant labels. You can also get information from the University of Georgia Extension Walter Reeves's website and other local reputable websites for sun requirements of plants that grow here in Georgia. We do not advise going to the University of North Dakota for plant advice unless you are planning to move there real soon. Full sun is at least six hours, although vegetables typically need at least eight hours of sun per day to grow successfully. Partial sun or shade refers to plants that require three to six hours of sunlight per day and need relief from the intense late afternoon sun. But don't despair if your lot is largely sunless. Many plants tolerate some shade, although shade does not mean no sun exposure. Many plants prefer dappled shade more than deep shade. If this is your case and you want to grow vegetables, we advise renting a plot at a nearby community garden where you'll be much more successful. As you inspect your property, note where your water sources are located. 
If you have an irrigation system, identify all zones, all sprinkler heads, and emitters. Will you need an irrigation system to water plants and lawn, or can you handle it with a garden hose? Identify any wet areas, signs of erosion, and any safety or privacy issues that need to be addressed. You may need to call DigSafe or 811 to locate cable, gas, water, and sewer lines if you're embarking on any excavation. Remember, Georgia's frost line is not very deep, so digging down a foot can uncover a number of things you did not want to uncover. For many of us here in Cobb County, our lots have covenants and restrictions on what we can or cannot do to the exterior. This is a good time to review those rules and determine if you need to get approval from your homeowners association before embarking on a landscape project. After you've assessed your property or while you're doing that, you need to get your ideas together. What do you like? What don't you like? Formal? Natural? What makes you happy? What do you want to see when you look out the window? Do you need to block a view, like into your neighbor's windows or an unsightly lot? How much time and money do you want to spend in your garden? Prioritize. Hardscaping and irrigation and or drainage controls might need to be completed first so as not to disturb your landscape after planting. You pay now or pay later. You do not want to have to rip out what you just put in. If your front yard needs work, you may need to address that first as your neighbors see it and it's usually the most noticeable. However, if you need to get heavy equipment through your front yard to get to the back, do that first so as not to pay twice. Play yards, decks, patios, fire pits, water features, pathways, retaining walls, or other hardscaping projects can often require moving heavy materials or equipment across your property. Be sure to work that into your plans. There's an awful lot to consider, but thinking and planning ahead will save you time. In our area, slope and woods are often the norm. If you want an expansive lawn on a steep wooded lot, you can bet dollars to donuts that you'll be spending a lot more of your money than if you keep the trees and plant understory trees and shrubs that will help control erosion and grow in the shade. Once you've thought through the issues and goals of your landscape, it's a great idea to sketch it out. Granted, this illustration was done by a professional, but DIYers can get a copy of their plat, make a photocopy, and draw in the rest. Maybe not exactly to scale, but a general idea. Locate north and draw in circles for large trees. You can also note sunny spots and shady spots and lawn. Make lists of plants you like that grow in shade or sun and indicate what part of the yard they need to grow in. You can also hire a professional landscaper to help you figure it out, but get to know your yard first. As they do not live there, you do. It makes their job easier and more effective if you understand your lot, at least somewhat. pH is a measure of soil acidity or alkalinity. pH affects how plants absorb nutrients and is measured on a scale of 1 to 14. A pH below 7 is considered acidic and above 7 alkaline or basic. 7 is neutral. Different plants require different pH levels to grow. Most of our soil in this area is acidic. The good news is that many ornamental plants require a pH between 5.2 to 6.5. The soil test measures the pH. Based on what you wish to grow in that area, the report tells you if you need to alter the pH, such as adding lime, which raises it, or sulfur, which lowers it. The test also tells you if your soil is good or lacking in six of the 13 essential nutrients for plant growth and makes recommendations. Our Cobb County Extension Office collects and sends soil samples to UGA for analysis. You pay a small fee of $9 and get your results in about two weeks. Be sure to indicate what you plan to grow in this soil. 
lawn, vegetables, blueberries, ornamental plants. This is important because each has its own needs. So how do I do that? No worries. Go on our YouTube channel, which you're on right now, and look for the link on how to do a soil test and follow the instructions. You bring your sample or samples in a clean bag and com can complete the process at the extension office. You do not need the brown sample bag until you get there. This is a sample of the report you will get back with recommendations. You may need to do some math to calculate how much lime or nutrients to add to a small lot because it's given in pounds per 1,000 square feet. How often do I need to do it? If you're embarking on a major re-landscaping project, do it before you start. Otherwise, about every three years to be sure you are giving your plants what they need to thrive. Like a house foundation, soil is the foundation for plants. In addition to proper pH and nutrients, soil texture is important to growing plants successfully. In Georgia, our red clay is full of nutrients, but clay's very fine particles binds them up. Organic matter helps release the nutrients and gets them to the plant's roots. Examine your soil texture. It should be easily shoveled and should crumble in your hands. If it's super hard, you will need to add organic matter to improve the soil structure, provide improved aeration, moisture retention, and soil fertility. Organic matter is sold as compost or soil amendment in the gardening sections of most uh, stores. You can also make your own compost and work it into the soil over time. Add at least a two to three inch layer of compost, decayed leaves, untreated dry grass clippings or old manure, and using a shovel or rototiller, mix it into the top 10 to 12 inches of soil before planting. UGA does not recommend incorporating sand into clay soils because it may result in a concrete-like soil structure. Look at your plan, the amount of sunlight and soil conditions, and select plants that will thrive in those conditions. For example, some plants cannot tolerate wet feet. Do not plant those in a boggy area. Instead, select plants that like moist soil, like hydrangeas, sweet flag, and others. Again, don't fret. UGA is full of publications that list information on plants that will help you select the right plant for the right place. And we will show you how to get to the UGA publications website to find those. Determine how big and how tall plants will be at maturity and space them accordingly. Place taller plants in the back of the garden bed and shorter or creeping ones toward the front and edges of the bed. If planting near structures, this is especially important. Gardening books and magazines and websites are great resources for getting pictures of plants that work well together. And if you remember nothing else from this presentation, remember this. Read the plant label before buying. Also, consider plants native to Georgia. Native plants adapt to the local climate and soil and are hardier, lower maintenance, and more self-sufficient than non-natives. Once established, they also require less pesticides, fertilizers, and watering, so they are good for the environment and save you time and money. Natives also help return an area to a healthy ecosystem. They provide a watchable wildlife habitat because they attract butterflies, birds, insects, reptiles, and mammals. Well, maybe some mammals you don't wanna see in your backyard, but mammals nonetheless. Follow a planting calendar for our area. These can be obtained online or from the Cobb County Extension Office, usually by plant type. We have schedules for trees and shrubs, bulbs, flowers, and lawns. Each type has its own schedule. One size does not fit all as the growth habit dictates what to plant when. Some plants such as pansies and kale tolerate cold and can be planted in the fall. Tomatoes and most annuals don't tolerate cold and should be planted after the danger of frost has passed. 
Spring flowering bulbs should not be planted until the soil temperature reaches 60 degrees or below. Summer and fall flowering bulbs should be planted after the danger of frost has passed. In our area, the last frost date is considered to be April 15th or tax day. The first frost date is identified as October 31st. Fall is considered the best time of the year to plant or transplant for root growth and establishment of plants here in Georgia. Remember, if you moved here from a different climate, the calendar will be different. Again, read the plant labels and seed packets to learn when to plant for our climate zone. As a rule of thumb, dig a planting hole twice as wide and twice as deep as the pot or root ball. The picture on the left shows the correct sized hole. The picture on the right shows that you backfill the hole and tamp down the soil around the plant so that it is placed at the correct height. Remove the plant from the pot and gently untangle and spread the roots. Position the crown of the plant at or just below the soil surface. Planting depth is critical. If the crown or root flare is planted too deeply, it may develop crown rot. This is especially important when planting trees. Fill the planting hole with soil to the correct height, gently tamp down, then place the plant inside the hole, check for depth, backfill with soil, and gently tamp around the plant with your hand, tool, or your foot. Water thoroughly to ensure that the roots make contact with the soil and be sure you did not plant too deeply. Read the label or seed packet for information about when to plant, where to plant, how deep to plant, and how far apart to plant. One common landscaping mistake is not giving your plants enough room to grow. Consider what a tree or shrub will look like five years from now, not how it looks the day you planted it. Be patient. Trees and shrubs and many perennials do not really start to flourish until year three. Remember, reading the label or packet is one of the most important things you need to do to be a successful gardener. Some flowers and vegetables are easy to grow from seeds, such as lettuce and sunflowers, and you can sow them directly into the garden. Be sure to buy your seeds from a reputable company. Or instead of seeds, you can buy young plants, called transplants, from your local nursery. Buy healthy transplants and inspect them for diseases and insects before purchasing. Look at the roots. The roots of the plant should be white and loose, not brown or yellowed and root bound in the pot. If you can't easily pull the plant out of the pot to inspect it, that might be a clue that it's been in there too long. When inspecting and planting, do not pull the plant from the stem. Loosen it from the pot or ground underneath so as not to damage the plant. Accepting plants from your neighbors and friends is another great and cost-effective way to start or add to your garden. Great tip, become good friends with a master gardener if you aren't already. That's often a good source of plants. Here are some examples of flowers and vegetables that grow well from seed. While water is essential for plant growth, a huge majority of plant problems are caused by overwatering. Here in our clay soil, water is retained much longer than in a location whose soil is sandy. Mulch helps retain moisture, insulates plants from heat and cold, and helps control weeds. I always say mulch is the magic. Newer plants need more water than those already established. Seedling roots should never dry out, so water daily while they're small and then taper off as they get larger. New transplants need to be watered every other day or so until their roots get established. After that, how often to water depends on your soil, how humid your climate is, and how often it rains. The rule of thumb is one inch of water per week. Use a rain gauge or empty tuna can to measure water from a rain or sprinkler hose. Be sure to clean the tuna can, though, unless you like cats or other invited guests. The best time to water is in the cooler morning hours when plants are not as stressed by the heat. It also gives the leaves time to dry out and reduces the chances of disease like fungus. Water slowly and deeply. 
so the water soaks into the soil rather than running off it. Aim to water the roots of plants rather than the leaves. This helps discourage disease. What time is best? Morning. Do not overwater. More than 80% of plant disease is caused by overwatering. Mulch helps keep the weeds out and the water in. Especially in vegetable gardens and essential if growing tomatoes, mulch also keeps harmful spores from splashing up on the leaves and helps prevent disease. All sorts of mulch are available. Good choices include pine straw, pine bark mulch, pine bark mini nuggets and shredded hardwood mulch and leaves, even newspaper and cardboard. I use different kinds depending on where I'm using it. Nuggets break down slowly. Shredded mulch needs to be replaced more frequently, but it adds organic matter to my hard clay. Avoid grass clippings because they're too fine and prevent water penetration into the soil. They also may contain undesirable chemicals if the lawn was sprayed. For vegetables, I like to use shredded leaves or newsprint. Be sure to wet the newsprint down so it does not blow away. There's a UGA extension publication on mulching vegetables, which you can download for, for the website, and I will give you the address at the end of the presentation. Mulch can also be used as a ground cover for areas where plants and turf grass don't thrive or you do not want plants to grow. Cover the soil around the plant with about two to three inches of mulch. Too much mulch harms the plants because it basically intercepts the rain and irrigation meant for your plant's root systems. When applying mulch around a tree, leave a small space around the trunk instead of stacking mulch onto it to avoid rot and a habitat for rodents. The same is true along the foundation of your house or other structures. Lastly, maintain for success. Some flowers need to be deadheaded to maintain vigorous growth and keep blooming. Deadheading means removing the mature flowers. This is particularly true with roses. Water and replenish mulch is needed. Allow the water to penetrate deeply. Slow and steady wins that race. Replenish mulch to conserve moisture, control weeds, and improve the appearance of the garden. Pull weeds before they get big and out of hand. Pull them up by the roots. Otherwise, see you next year, or next week, or next month. Pull before they make seeds. Some weeds produce tens of thousands of seeds on one little plant. Stay on top of weeding. To learn more about weeding, watch the In the Weeds on this channel. The three numbers on the fertilizer label refer to the percentages by weight of the major nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus P and potassium K, also referred to as potash. The numbers on the label are listed in that order. So the numbers 10, 10, 10 mean that the bag contains equal amounts by weight of each of these three nutrients. Typically, we fertilize in the early spring and once or twice during the growing season with an application of 888 or 101010 fertilizer. Apply about one and a half pounds per 100 square feet. If you do a soil test, the results tell you how and when to fertilize. Slow release fertilizers provide plants with a constant supply of nutrients throughout the growing season. They are best used on annuals planted in spring and summer because their release relies on warm temperatures. They can also be applied inside the planting hole in the form of a tablet or plant spikes as they will not harm the plant's roots. Do not use general fertilizers in the planting hole because they can damage tender roots. Most woody ornamental plants need only one application of slow release fertilizer per year. When in doubt, read the plant label. Routinely inspect your plants for diseases and insects since no plant is completely immune to them. For identification and recommended control of specific insect pests and diseases, consult with your local county extension office. And again, always follow the directions and instructions on the labels of pesticides, herbicides, or other products you use in your garden. 
Like weeds, our YouTube channel also has classes on insects and diseases of both ornamental and vegetable plants. Anyone can prune, but not everyone prunes correctly. Remember these three basic T's of pruning. Proper tools, techniques, and timing are all important. When you shop for tools, consider quality and durability before price. Most pruning tasks in the landscape can be accomplished by using these types of pruners. Hand pruners. They're used to cut twigs and small branches under one half inch in diameter. Some can cut larger branches. Lopping shears. They have longer blades and extended handles for leverage. They can also be used for larger branches one half to one and a half inches in diameter. Pruning saws. They're used for branches larger than one and larger than one and a half inches in diameter. And to cut, pull the curved blade toward you. Pole pruners. They remove branches that cannot be reached from the ground. They come in many forms, including battery powered attachments. Hedge clippers, manual or powered, are used to shear hedges and plants when you want a neatly trimmed appearance. Some master gardeners have eliminated the hedge clippers in favor of the bypass hand pruners and loppers. This is what I use. These pruners have a blade design that works like scissors. Two blades, at least one of which is curved, glide past each other. When used correctly, they enable a sharp, clean cut close to the stem so that almost no damage occurs to the plant. Other types of pruners tend to crush soft plant tissues, including powered or manual hedge clippers. It's very important that your tools are sharp and clean before using them. A good practice is to always clean and sharpen your tools before you put them away. Dull blades shred the branches, making them more vulnerable to disease. Equally important is wiping down your blades with a diluted bleach solution or sanitizing wipes between plants. This prevents the spread of disease caused by bacteria, fungus, or insects. Proper pruning is not taking a pair of hedge clippers and shearing off the tops of your azaleas or camellias. Pruning is art and science coming together into a set of techniques to properly prune your plants for beauty as well as a happy and healthy landscape. The Master Gardener Training and Continuing Education Program treats this topic with reverence. Why? Many homeowners and even professional landscapers do not understand the science behind pruning. You need to understand how plants grow and where and when they bloom in order to know how and when to prune them. We find this so important that we want you to do three things after this class. Download the two University of Georgia pruning bulletins shown in the slide and watch our video, Pruning in the Home Landscape, yep, on this channel. And if you have Japanese maples, we offer a special one on how to prune them. Pruning times are determined by when the plants form their flower buds. Spring flowers, such as dogwood, forsythia, azaleas, and rhododendrons, set their flower buds in the fall. Plants that flower during the summer, such as crepe myrtles and abelia, form their buds on new growth, so they can be pruned during the winter months. Generally, plants that flower before May should be pruned after they bloom, and those that flower after May can be pruned just prior to spring growth. Remember to remove dead foliage and stems in the fall or when you notice them. If a plant is damaged during the year, remember to move, remove all damaged parts, even if it's not the right time to prune. Sometimes you need to sacrifice flowers for the overall health of the plant in the long run. Please explore our library of videos and visit the UGA Extension Publications website for these and many other topics. Your questions can be answered via the web, calls, or in person. We're here for you. If you enjoy internet searching, we do recommend searching in the .edu universe and with universities that cover our climate zone. And to get links to many of the publications, you'll see it's um, extension.uga.edu 
slash publications and just uh, in the search button just put your topic and up will come up any of the publications free and available to you. So in conclusion, have fun and be patient. Gardening is a process that takes time and it is not an exact science. And remember to stop and smell the, well, whatever it is that you grow. We hope that you will find our information informative and helpful. Thanks for watching. And please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel.